Barbara, but thank you for joining us on stage. Very excited to host this fireside chat. Thank you. Great to be here. <laughs> you are the CEO and founder of Enride. Uh, you're a serial entrepreneur, and you started on the factory floor of one of the major OEMs before founding Enride in 2016. So let's start from the beginning. Why did you start Enride, and what was the vision back then? Um, I always believe that you have the duty to try to do something better from where you started. And I felt that the whole industry was not doing enough to make this change happen. And uh, knowing what I knew now, I'm even more convinced that it's needed than I was back then. I think that technology is an amazing thing, but it's what you make out of it it's, that really makes the difference. And I think that you're crazy if you start a company. But if you don't know why you're doing it, I don't think that it's that easy. But I think we started a company to make a difference and tell the story about something else was actually doable. And that's still the reason why we're still around. And it's a pretty bold move to go up against the giants in this industry. Uh, and also, Kind of today, looking at where you are, you work with some of the world's largest clients, such as PepsiCo, uh, uh, Mars, Heineken. Uh, if you look at them, where is the company today and the original vision you talked about? How has that changed? I would say that it actually hasn't that much. Uh, I quite often get the question that we have changed a lot over the years, but for me, it's always been about the vision to utilize digital, electric, and autonomous technology to create something completely different when it comes to transport. And the whole ecosystem didn't exist when we started. I mean, the best example is that there were no electric trucks. So you couldn't buy an electric truck in the market. So we actually had to take all trucks that was diesel, take off the diesel engine, and retrofit them for electric. And that is uh, why we needed to go back then. And from the outside, people say, like, why are you retrofitting electric trucks? Is Android retrofitting electric diesel trucks? <laughs> and that was the perception. And I also, it's like the, one of the best advice you, when you hear, like, the, all the great, uh, uh, like, VCs and everyone that's on the board is like, do one thing and do one thing great. I didn't get that memo. <laughs> and if there's something I regret a lot of times over the years is that the complexity of what we have been trying to do is quite it's extreme. But at the same time, if there were any other way to trying to accomplish what we actually accomplished, we have to, we should have taken that path. So we literally had hundred different problems that needed to be solved to be able to get ours where we needed to be. And that means that we had to adopt over time, change, solve, and then take the next challenge. And that has always, not always been the easiest to, to say from the outside understand. But from a vision perspective, I think that the first pitch we did actually is still valid. Mm. Then the number of Excels we did along the way, the number of explanatory PowerPoints we've done, and over the years, they have become better and better. But for me, the vision, and the vision we tried to, uh, the, our North Star with autonomous electrical vehicle, is really where we're going. We're not there yet. But it's still the vision to create a transport system, a robotic transport system that's digital, electric, and autonomous. That's the vision. And the means we had to do to get there are plenty and uh, quite complex. But that's still what we're trying to do. And getting a customer like PepsiCo, for example, what is the pitch for Enride? Well, how did you get them? Um, for us, it's about when we work with the clients, so we go into them and say, it's like, hey, 
this is as is. You currently have a carbon-based transport system. And uh, you want to make your KPIs happen when it comes to cost, performance, and decarbonization. We are a current key solution for that. If we work with us, we'd help to solve your problems. You don't have to worry about which technology to work with. You don't have to work, worry about getting all these complex things together. We provide our platform to be able to provide that solution. And that's uh, how we get the customers like PepsiCo. Great. And let's brag a little. What are you most proud about in your journey so far with Enride? Um, the people that I got the privilege to do it with. And uh, the amazing memories we created along the way. And I mean, if there's something that stands out is, of course, when we were first to go on public road. Uh, with a permit in 2019. And um, another one was uh, that we got the first permit to go on public road in the US. And uh, we actually have the first driving license for an autonomous vehicle allowed on public road in the US. Uh, so we have had a lot of milestones along the way and accomplished great things. And I think that better or worse when it comes to creating what's going to be, is that you will quickly move the frontier forward. That it's everyone just perceived that it's already done, but we don't remember how much effort it actually went to move that to that point at the first time. So, so much things that we are very proud of, but I would summarize it that over these years, and that's all we have as humans, we created magic together and made extraordinary things happen. And that is something I'm extremely proud of. You should be. So let's move over to tougher things. Yeah. <laughs> fundraising. Oh. Uh, it's been a pretty tough fundraising market for the last couple you mean of years. Fundraising? <laughs> yes. Uh, and you are also building a software plus hardware business, which requires CapEx. How has that experience been? Well, raising capital for Enright has always been a pain. It's been, uh, I mean, when we started, there were literally no deep tech investors or hardware investors in the ecosystem in Europe. We started in 2016, and there was a lot of uh, the funds where you're starting up or with purely software. So, uh, I mean, the first investor was my co-founder's mother. <laughs> And she did it out of an account uh, and a company where she actually was hoping she would lose the money because that was a bit better for tax purposes. Great. So that's just how much the first investors believed in us. She should uh, be happy now, though. Yeah, it's so far so good. <laughs> um, but um, so, I mean, the first six or seven million dollars we actually raised from. Um, literally $10,000 per person. I was actually the first, when we did our first two million raise, uh, I was touring together with a movie, if someone remembers the Al Gore movie that came out, We Don't Have Time. And someone had a, a very, in hindsight, quite funny, that we should actually showcase the movie, and then we're going to pitch afterwards that we should raise for this company. So we toured a lot of uh, sh cinemas around Sweden, actually watching the movie and then getting up on stage, pitching, invest in Enroid. So, and uh, we did that uh, in a lot of different cinemas around Sweden and managed to get the first $2 million in. And uh, that is how we have managed to build on that. But the first, before Series A, we didn't have any professional investors. And it was one, literally one beer at a time, one pitch at a time. And um, one conclusion that uh, I have is that the cost of capital is actually constant. So it cost us back then six or seven percent uh, in dinners and beers to raise 
the capital will then back then as well. And the last half billion round you raised, <laughs> was that as tough? Um, I would say that um, that was probably the easiest round we did. And uh, it's, uh, I'm not saying it gets any better, but the first few years when it comes to raising capital for what we did was tough. Yeah. And uh, the longest we had runway for was two months. So you learn to live with a stress level that um, is, I wouldn't say it healthy, but refreshing. Great. And <clears throat> you're trying to build uh, frontier tech and also pushing market maturity, yeah. uh, which is very ambitious. Uh, if you look at the European entrepreneurial ecosystem, what do you think is needed to uh, empower more entrepreneurs to build ambitious companies? I think the community. It's, uh, it's a starting, and I heard something very smart last night, and is that we're starting to see a next generation of entrepreneurs in, in Europe people that made a great company happen, or maybe like uh, with less tech focus. I mean, primarily the industry, what we call tech in Europe, has been what I would call tech uh, application companies. I mean, everything from Klarna to uh, um, um, Rocket, to, I mean, all the successful concepts have been made about digitalizing and creating and bringing something into new, applying technology in new services. And very little has been done when it comes to, you say, tech or deep tech. But as you actually created a um, lot of people that actually has been through the journey and have the cash and want to invest in the future, we are also starting to see that you now can do more out there projects and that people understand what it is to build a company and the pains you go through in doing that. Mm. And uh, so I'm actually very uh, optimistic when it comes to that. At the same time, I think that we as entrepreneurial community need to challenge both the legislations, we need to say challenge the governments, and we need to challenge the context to continue to build great companies and to challenge as is. Yeah. And you were um, recently awarded as one of Time's 100 top climate leaders, and Enride is decarbonizing ground freight. So coming back to governments, what do you think is the most important action that you want to see from governments in the next year to really raise the climate agenda? I think that we need to understand that it's not just about the climate, it's about creating a better technology, better society going forward. And we have taken step by step more and more responsibility of the impact that we do on the planet to make it not just sustainable, but resilient. And I think that it's one of my favorite quotes from Nietzsche, is that nothing destroys a cause as much as the faulty arguments for it. And I think that the environmental movement in many ways has also has a lot of faulty arguments for it. And it's also been very unscientific. And if there's anything that we, that I think that being a startup, a tech company, we are rational people. I think that there's a big part of being an entrepreneur is to believe in enlightenment, to take that moral and obligation of trying to build something better. And I think that we have to also be realistic in the solutions that we provide forward to actually have sustainable, from a business perspective, solutions going forward. And that we are rational in how they are deployed, that's how we can make real impact happen. And also, I just want to take the opportunity to say it as well. As Europeans, as entrepreneurs, don't stop daring to fail. Because moving the needle towards the future is tough. And I think SpaceX is a great example. Mm. Imagine SpaceX happened in a European context. First the rocket blow up. The feedback would be, you failed. Not what you learned from that. 
and the second rocket blow up. You failed. And that mentality we need to challenge at the core if we want to be and build a stronger tech community in Europe. I mean, we're going to fail companies, but no one talks about the failures you do as an entrepreneur, as an investor, as a company builder. And the first electric trucks we got on the road, they worked sometimes, <laughs> but then we got them on the road. And if there is something that we have with us, is that we are, sort of say, pointing fingers upon the people that actually make real things happen. Mm. The people that want to make things happen, we blame them for our shortcomings to take actions. Yeah. And that's what we need to change from the government, from the big companies, across the board. Because it's our joint responsibility to try to build something better. And if we don't stand up for that, who's going to? Yeah. And you are active both in US and Europe. Do you see a difference in the US market? I mean, like, a little bit back to saying what I truly believe is different in the US market is that you have an understanding of how much trial and error it is to build a company. And how much you need to go big and how much you have to put in to creating the future. And the funding gap between Europe and US is huge. And I think that's a big reason why we see so few deep tech companies coming out of Europe as well. If we, you want to do, and I love SpaceX, great example. Is there even a financial market in Europe that can support such an ambitious project? I would say and argue no. And that has also secondary consequences. So if there's anything we need to do is that we need to challenge legislators, we need to challenge in the whole community to keep improving. I mean, people like yourselves, the venture capitalists, if you go back 15 years, didn't exist in Europe. It's a new market, it's a growing market, but we also need to get the money in to have the really bold ambitions, to really literally challenge what's going to be the next step. And that's a big difference between Europe and the US, is that they still have that belief that you can do extraordinary things. Yeah. And Europe can as well, but we... Uh, need to see that in ourselves as well. Yeah. And coming back to the stress level you mentioned before. So being a founder and CEO, you're surrounded by people, but I can imagine it can be very, very stressful and sometimes a lonely place. How do you get the support you need and how do you deal with the pressure and the emotional roller coaster it can be to run a company? Well, it's the, I think the medical question is you don't. You don't. You just have to get ways and peoples and individuals around you to support you. And sometimes you just crack and just literally collapse. And uh, it's um, when we raised the first non professional money, uh, we took in $1.4 million from an angel investor. And it took 250 calls. Wow. And uh, he called me around the clock, and uh, when he finally said, I'm going to put in the money, um, I literally fell down and collapsed. Because we had minus one month of runway on in, in the bank. And um, I recovered from that as well. But that's uh, kind of toughness that it is to build a company. And uh, I think that you need to have great people. You have the, not really just the people, and it, if there's anything like advice, get real people around you. Not like, when you are really in the ringers, when you're really challenged, you have to have kind-hearted, warm people that are tough themselves. And I'm very fortunate to have a lot of those people both in, in the company and around the company, and also as friends and family. But make that conscious decision to get those people and take care of them in your life. Because they are the reason why you, so to say, 
remain sane in a world that's not really sane. And speaking about advice, we have a very entrepreneurial audience here. I heard that it's 13,000 people at Slush this year, many kind of aspiring entrepreneurs. You spoke about one advice. What are the other kind of key advice you would give to entrepreneurs who want to start their own business? I mean, it's about literally about believing and continue to believe in yourself and to really how to say it? Just enjoy the creativity. Be proud of what you do. And also see that in others. Help each other. And something that was truly a gift that I learned when I was in Silicon Valley is that give to others. Don't be afraid of what is created together. And there are a lot of people out there that are in your situation. And in, I think that in the culture of where I come from, you're supposed to have and be very much bottled up. You should carry yourself. You, uh, if you have an idea, you should keep it to yourself. And um, you should, uh, your problems and your problems, you should do the accounting yourself, you should do everything yourself. And I think the magic, if you really can open up and see in others, how can we help each other in this? How can we help someone else to succeed? Because that, for me, was entrepreneurship is. Mm. Help each other to, exceed, like, to succeed. And that is, for me, the magic that is creating companies. Yeah. And it took me quite a long time to learn that. I can imagine. And you talked about being close to bankruptcy, collapsing, <laughs> struggling to raise. You know, it's a tough journey. What's your personal drive? What, what is the kind of drive from you as a person? Duty. Duty to whom? The right, to doing the right thing. And uh, it sounds as bombastic as it is, is, but you need a reason to get up in the morning. I mean, sometimes the body's going to ache, you're going to be tired, you're going to be... You just want to stay in bed. And that reason you get up in the morning is what you need to be very sure about. And some drive, are driven by money. Then make it clear that it's, it's about the money. But for me, it's been about trying to do the right thing, to try to create something, and to prove that something different could be done. And if I wasn't clear that that was the reason, I would never felt, it, so say, have the moral argument for myself. Why should I get up? Why should I keep putting me through? all this pain that it is to build a company. And the day I don't feel that way is also the day I quit. Fair enough. So I see time is flying. Um, can you let us in on the future? What are you building towards? What's coming up for Enride? I still believe that future will be digital, electric and autonomous. So we're in a very interesting age right now where we're actually starting to see the fruit of all the hard work that's been done over the last 10 years. We're going to start to see the first on-scale applications of digital, electric, and autonomous vehicles being transported. And one of the most amazing projects that we have is that we're deploying in Dubai 200 autonomous vehicles. And that would be on the size the first major deployment of autonomous freight transport vehicles in the world. And with that, that mark a very important first step, what would be and literally rewrite the map for the future. And it's not going to be easy, but we're planning to do it anyway. That's great. Very exciting future coming up then. Thank you so much, Robert. A round of applause for Robert from Enride. Thank you. Thank you.